verse 21, it says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So you see here the same thing. The Spirit is a seal and the Spirit is a guarantee. Let's turn a few chapters ahead to chapter 5, verse 5. It says, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. There is a very good reason that the presence of the Spirit of God in your body should be a guarantee that you will eventually be glorified. Remember how in the Old Testament, God's Holy Spirit dwelled in the temple, and how only the high priest could enter into the presence of God. There is no possible way that the Spirit of God could dwell in us in our sinful state, because man is sinful and God is holy. But this is exactly what we are told has happened in the New Covenant. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. It says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? I want to show you prophecies of the New Covenant in the Old Testament. And you will see that the plan of God has always been to find a way to be able to dwell in his people the same way that he used to dwell in the temple and begin to change their hearts from the inside out. But before he could do this, he needed to find a way to forget your sins so that he could dwell in you. Let's first turn to Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. This is when God made a prophecy about a new covenant, one which he says will not be like the old one. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. We know that this prophecy was not just about Israel because Hebrews chapter 8 tells us that this also applies to Christians. We see that God has a plan to remember our sins no more and that he will put his law in our hearts. In the other prophecies about this new covenant, we see more details about how exactly God plans to put his law in our hearts. This is very important. You should make a note of these prophecies if you don't already know them. So let's turn to Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 25. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Here we see that God promised that it would be his spirit that would change our minds and hearts. This must have been pretty shocking to any Jew at the time. The Holy Spirit that was in the temple would somehow be in the body of every believer in the new covenant? How could this be? How could the holiness of God be in a sinful man? The answer is in verse 25. Before he dwells in us, he sprinkles clean water on us and cleanses us from our filthiness. This is done because he punished all of our sins on Christ and he is willing to forget them. It is also important to remind you here of the verses we read that said, If this happens to you, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, 
it is a guarantee of the future glory. How can this be a guarantee? What if I sin again after I'm saved? Does that mean that the Holy Spirit would have to leave? No, it would not be a guarantee if it was so easy to lose the Holy Spirit. What those verses are saying is that if the Spirit of Almighty God who created the universe is dwelling in you and you're not dead, then it is proof that God has agreed to view the blood of the Lamb and not the law in your case. God has forgiven your sins, past, present, and future. That is why he can dwell in his people now. A way has been made to punish all sin, so God can dwell in his people and change their hearts. So what happens if you do sin when you're saved? Turn to Ephesians 4, verse 30. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God does not leave you if you sin, but he is grieved. Notice that the seal remains. The guarantee is still a guarantee. But God is grieved when you sin. If this has truly happened to you, if God truly dwells in you, when you sin, it will break your heart, and God will convict you of it and lead you to turn from that sin. If I sin, it breaks my heart. It convicts me. It makes me want to never do it again. That is one of the reasons God has given us His Spirit, so that we will be broken over sin. Let's turn to John chapter 16, starting in verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Before you were a Christian, it was possible to sin and not feel any real or godly remorse. But now that the Spirit of God dwells in you, sin will become detestable to you. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature and will begin to hate the sin he once loved. This process is called regeneration. You really are a new creature if you are in Christ. It's like before you were a pig or some other kind of animal that eats waste and trash. When you were the old creature, you never cared that you were eating waste. You thought it was normal. But what if one day you were supernaturally transformed into a human? You might continue to try to eat waste for a while, but pretty soon you'll say, I can't eat this trash anymore. When God saves people, it's like this. It's a supernatural thing that changes you into a new creature with different desires. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, that the one who began a good work in you will see it to completion. God will spend the rest of your life conforming you to the image of Christ, which is made possible by God's Spirit in you. This is the doctrine of regeneration, that God's Spirit is what changes us, and the Spirit accomplishes this by the conviction of sins, among other things. I will move on to the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ. Jesus was raised from the dead. We are told by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 that this is a very important part of the gospel message. Let's turn there to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 16. It says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So why is the resurrection of Christ so important to the gospel? Although the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is what saves us, the resurrection of Christ proves that this sacrifice was acceptable. It shows all men everywhere that Jesus was who he said that he was, and that he is the only way to the Father. You can see in verse 5 through 8 that Paul makes the point that this was witnessed by many people. He says, And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, 
but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. The resurrection of Christ is used as proof of the claims of Christ by Paul when preaching to the Gentiles in Acts 17. Let's turn there. Acts 17, starting in verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Paul mentions the resurrection to them as evidence of the gospel being true. But there is another reason that the resurrection is important. To put it in one word, hope. Back in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how Jesus raising from the dead is the first fruits of the resurrection of all believers. You know from reading the New Testament that the early church was ready to die for the cause of the gospel. And this was actually because of their understanding of the resurrection. They knew that death had no more victory over them. Death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? They knew that Christ's raising from the dead was proof that they also would be resurrected to eternal life. This is the great hope of all believers. So the resurrection is the proof of the claims of Christ the proof that God accepted the payment of Christ for your sins, and the proof that one day all believers will be raised from the dead as well. And the other side of that is that it also proves that his claims of judging the world in the future are true. And that is what Paul told the Gentiles the resurrection meant to them. Here are some verses about the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the gospel message. Acts 2, verse 23 and 24. Acts 3, verse 14 and 15. Acts 4, verse 33. Acts 10, verse 39 through 41. Acts 13, verse 30 and 31. Acts 17, verses 2 and 3. Romans 1, verses 1 through 4. Romans 4, verses 25. Romans 6, verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, Ephesians 1, verse 20, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14, 2 Timothy 2, verse 8, and 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Finally, the idea of trusting Christ alone for our salvation. This is very important to the gospel. The book of Galatians is about the following question. Do we need to do good works in order to be saved? The answer is no. We must repent and believe the gospel in order to be saved. And if we are truly saved, the evidence of that salvation will be that good works will show in our lives. Everyone who is a Christian will begin to show some fruit of that salvation, the fruits of the Spirit of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. For example, when Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, he did not mean that the only way you can love him is by keeping the commandments. He is saying that if you love him, if you are truly saved, you will show evidence of that love through obedience. Good works are the evidence of salvation, not the requirements of salvation. The book of Galatians tells us that it is dangerous to believe that something you are doing is helping your salvation. If you believe that, then you do not understand what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago. Paul says that it is dangerous to believe this because it is a different gospel. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 2. It says, Indeed I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Our hope of righteousness is in faith in Christ. That is our only hope of eternal life. 
our only hope